All right, so today is going to be a lot of hands on components for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Caleb kick things off. Um, and we're going to talk about this tropical cyclone detection. Um, he'll show you how to get to the labs um, that you'll be working on. Um, and then we will go ahead and take a nice little 15 minute break. And then we'll jump right into our final lab for the day, which is the steady flow estimation. Um, and so when we say challenge, it's really kind of a challenge amongst yourselves um, to see who can get the best results from the challenges provided. Uh, so this is where the challenges um, channel within our Slack workspace comes in. Um, so as you're getting results, uh, feel free to post in there and uh, it'll just be nice bragging rights uh, at, the, at the end of the day. And uh, we may or may not have you share your solution with the group, uh, depends on if you want to do that or not. Um, so that's enough out of me for the day. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Caleb. Awesome, thanks, Troy. All right, so we all have to get on the cluster again. Hopefully everybody remembers how to do that. If not, the uh, <clears throat> basically just go shoot through the same thing you did yesterday, get on to Curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, I'm going to pull up the tab first. And it should be, the slide should be in an, is it announcements? Yeah, announcements. How to connect. And I usually only use this because everything should be kind of saved. Um, just to get, you're not seeing my screen. There we go. Um, just to get this hyperlink, right? So no spoiler here. We're going to use Chrome. It's probably the hardest part is remembering your login. So I cheat. I have it save it. So I believe, and I don't, is Jeremy on, Troy? I don't think he is. I am here. Yep, he's here. Awesome. Do we have to get a new key today? We do, don't we? You need to get a new key. All right, cool. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so just you just follow exactly the same steps as yesterday. So we'll have to get in, hit the hackathon login, use the desktop SSH. Make a note of this hash. I save it to Word, not Word, Notepad. Copy all that. And we go back. Tab. Let that connect. Yeah, so all I'm doing right now for anyone that's strolling in late, we're just connecting to the cluster again. It's exactly the same steps you did yesterday um, from the slide that's the slides that are under the announcement that Jeremy um, posted yesterday. So we wait for that to kick up. You can see mine did, so that's good. And the reason we're doing this, again, the same way is you have to get a new key. Um, for anyone who's coming in. So you can't use the same key as yesterday. You got to generate a new key. So that's why we have to go through this. All right. And then, let's see. My no vision says. Then I believe I'll type this in. Jeremy, we typed this in on the. Uh, I always forget this one step. We take that in here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get your new key. Yeah, wait a little bit.
Oh yeah, everyone's doing it. Good. Good, good, good. Just waiting for the port foray forward game to come out. <clears throat> there we go. At the port forwarding. And then copy that. And then, oh, that was a new one. Gotta open a local terminal. So I am on a Windows machine. So I know they have a new uh, Windows terminal but I still use command prompt and then I type in PowerShell because I like the black background it makes me feel like I'm in Linux. <laughs> but you just go ahead and, and paste that command from the port forwarding. Give it a minute to log. Now there is something we'll probably do. So after we're done the climate lab today, we'll go ahead and shut down the lab and we'll have to do this same step again, but we won't need a new key. But what we'll have to do is launch a new script for the CFD steady state flow lab. Um, but I'll talk about that after we finish everything we're doing. And then if you look at this, I think I jumped it. You guys have to come up and then you just go to your local host. And I'm on a VPN. I don't think that should make any difference. Nope. And there we go. All right, so that took a little bit of time for me. I'm going to uh, give everybody a minute or more. I think it's still loading. Let's see, let's see, let's see. If you have questions, please ask in the chat. But yeah, we're just following the same exact thing we did yesterday to get on to Curiosity. And then what we'll do is instead of intro to deep learning, we'll be in tropical cyclone estimation, intensity estimation, right? And there's a, there's a series of notebooks in that. <clears throat> but before we get into all that, I have some slides that go over the really high level what we're doing, right? Um, kind of like AI for science, let's look at this tropical cyclone detection. So I'm gonna give it maybe a couple more minutes, probably two more minutes, and I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting. I hope everyone can see that. I know Zoom had this thing where you couldn't share, you could share like tabs and not screens. Can you see that, Troy? You can hear my dog too. It's the PowerPoint. Yeah, I can see it. All right. So yeah, a couple more minutes, everyone. And then I'm going to start just presenting. As you can see over here to the side, it's not that many slides. It's like, I don't know, eight slides. <clears throat> so it's not going to take long. And then we'll just jump right in. We'll get into our breakout rooms and everyone will start, you know, working on the, the climate lab. And I'm looking around. So anyone that came in late, I, I didn't check participants before I started everything. All we did was you have to log back into Curiosity again. So you'll follow the same procedure you did yesterday from the slides Jeremy posted in the announcements. And the whole reason we have to do that is we got to generate a new key for today. And then you'll launch your climate lab. And we'll be good to go. So let me, uh, actually, if I push this over here, find this. Dun, 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 dun. All right, I guess you could, can we do reactions? Is there reactions in Zoom? I think there is. So if you're having an issue or anything like that, will you go ahead and raise your hand? Um, if not, I'm gonna start in the next minute. Just cause we're short, we're not really short on time, but there's a lot of material to go through.
All right, so anyone having issues and raise their hand, will you go ahead and um, in the cluster support, looks like someone's already trying. Yeah, so there's some stuff going on in the cluster support channel on Slack. So if you are having issues, please go ahead and post that to the chat in there on Slack. All right. I'm sorry you're having issues too. Can I interrupt real quick? Is Jeremy, yes. Yep. Um, you guys can only run one job at a time. So if you're seeing your job like somebody mentioned that they saw their saw a job that was um, listed for max. You break it. You're you breaking up, Jeremy. And you're not, I'm sorry. Even in the when you run SQ and you're not actively running a job. You, those jobs or it will not you run another jeremy it's probably easier since you're on your phone easier for you to type out what you're saying and post it in the support channel yeah please and thank you i'll go ahead and uh so jeremy was saying if you hit SQ when you're on Curiosity, you can see here that here's your name. I don't, uh, yeah. These are uh, these individuals, you have to cancel. So just hit S cancel and you can use your name. So you can do something like, uh, I think mine's K Smith, right? Might have to be Dash U. I'm not the best slurm guy, it should be. Um, but you can cancel your jobs and then start over, or you can cancel the individual jobs outright by hitting the number here. That's canceled, you know, 12, one, six, four, that's yours. <clears throat> but there's not too many people that raised their hands. So we're gonna go ahead and begin. That way we can get into our breakout rooms and then we can continue getting help if needed, okay? All right, cool. All right, so today we're gonna do two labs that are based off of a real world Problem. So we're going to estimate tropical cyclone intensities. So basically, can we give some kind of category to these large storms that we see? So I live in Florida, so we're very familiar with all of these, right? Um, cat threes, cat, cat four hurricanes. We had cat five hit four years ago when I was here, and uh, I remodeled my outside bathroom when, when it came. So it was a great use of time. <laughs> but it wasn't too crazy. Um, I live in a very, very awesome part right south of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So if anyone knows Kennedy Space Station, that's there too, Space Center. Um, there's like this myth, right? That So they've never been hit head on by any Cat 5 hurricane or any hurricane, I think. It always comes around on the outskirts. Um, so they think NASA has some kind of thing they threw up in the sky to prevent stuff like that. So it's a cool myth for the Space Coast here. <laughs> um, but anyways, this is near and dear, right, for Floridians or anyone interested in climate. So we're going to look at some satellite images. And from that and some wind data that we actually have, we're going to do a multimodal approach to categorize these, uh, these cyclones. And, that, and that's our goal for today, right? So this is a little bit about everything. So this is our input. That's how our input data is going to look. Um, we're in the 232 by 232 pixels, a lot larger than our 28 by 28s that we were dealing with yesterday. We're also, I think, going to, yeah. So this is the, the paper that they're going off of. And I mentioned yesterday, you know, you typically see, and I think all the TAs mentioned too, powers of two, right? You can see here, we have some very wonky numbers um, as a number of filters in a layer, 288 and 272. So there is actually a paper that this was published from, this exact title, Tropical Cyclone Intensity Estimation, using a deep CNN. They can go through and read, and in the notebooks, there's a link to that paper too. So you can get more digestion on why they chose those sizes, right? Because it is kind of unique considering 
and a 10 by 10 kernel. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> so estimating a little background, right? This, ooh, I still can't pronounce that name. Dervrock, Dervrock technique. Uh, meteorologists have been attempting to estimate you know, tropical cyclones from satellite imagery, imagery for a long time, decades now. And when this individual, this uh, Vernon, I think Vernon Drovak, he submitted a paper describing how manual pattern matching can actually give an idea from satellite imagery what the category of the, the cyclone is going to be, right? What that label is. So the techniques applied manually for decades. And it wasn't until, I guess, about 20 years ago, which is crazy to think that's still 2000, um, that uh, it was actually automated, right? And the algorithm has been repeatedly improved upon and up till the present day. This is like the tried and true for NOAA. They're on version nine, it looks like, and it's still in operation in NOAA. However, these scientists were like, hey, we can, we can use deep learning, right? We know deep learning is great on images. Why not use deep learning? and see if we can make a better prediction and a faster prediction. So the goal of this lab is to see if we can indeed do that. Um, if this algorithm can achieve the same accuracy or better than this benchmark technique that NOAA uses today. And this is the CNN model they're using. It's uh, based off that paper. And it's kind of, it's very similar to Lynette other than the, like this 288 and 272, I believe. And this, 3,584 dense layer. So this is a cool picture though, because yesterday, I don't know if you remember, we all were looking at classical machine learning versus deep learning. And we have this input, right? So we have our input and you can think of all of these 3D blocks that they're showing in this diagram as the feature extraction, right? So that's the convolutional neural network part. And then when you get that last layer in the CNN, you pass it through to a fully connected layer, that's your classifier, right? So it's, it's pretty interesting that this mimics exactly what we were speaking of yesterday. Again, we're gonna to go to this six step approach. We have the data to start with um, and the task, though we know the task and the data, they can be cyclic, right? We could have a task and we need to collect data to solve the task. And, but we do have a model already and we know our loss. It's going to be explained in the notebook, but I'm pretty sure we use categorical cross entropy. Um, then we're going to train and we're going to evaluate. And what's really interesting about this is this isn't just an easy data set, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, five categories for hurricanes and two categories for tropical um, storm and depression, and then a no category, which is really interesting, right? There's no category. It's really Good to have things like this, um, you know, an unknown, just for outliers, right? Things that just don't make sense. And it could throw off precision recall or, or accuracy for like real world deployment. And uh, you can see that the wind speed associated with these is also part of the category, right? So we're actually gonna look into using this downstream. No pun intended. <laughs> and you can see again, this whole idea, right? So if you're a human and you're looking at these images, you might've looked at a million of them, right? But if you're looking at what we're looking at, I guess the scale, this is the same grid size too, it looks like in these satellite images. The CAT2 and the CAT4 look similar sizes as the CAT3 and the CAT5 look similar sizes. Um, but we all know wind speed has a huge impact to do with that, right? You can't go just off of size of the hurricane alone. I think one of the largest and widest hurricanes to hit since I've been here was, oh my gosh, I forget her name. Hurricane, uh, oh, forget it. I won't, I won't get it. But anyways, it was humongous. Like as soon as it hit Florida, it covered all the East coast of Florida, right? It was a gigantic hurricane, but it was only a cat three. So the whole point of that slide, sorry, I got derailed, is this wind speed makes a huge impact to the actual classification, right? So looking at it again, um, we'd mentioned here's, here's our network and I, the loss is gonna be, I mean, this is just going through what we're doing. The loss is gonna be 
multi-class cross entropy. We're going to use a SGD subgradient descent. And this is off on the numbers. I don't know why I said they're fixed. So we're going to use 72% for training. We're going to use 18% for testing, which gets us to 90%. And our validation set's going to be 10%. And this is the summary of the approach, right? So we are going to basically interpolate some text data to find the velocity um, at, at every point that we have a satellite image so we compare the two. And then we're going to do a multimodal approach to feed into the network and get a predicted class at the end. And again, they'll talk more about this in the notebook. So I'm kind of glancing through it. I want to make sure everyone has enough time. So we're doing an image that's the original image is 1024 by 1024 by three, right? So it's RGB too. So this is a lot larger than what we're dealing with yesterday. But we're going to resize it to 256 by 256. Now, from there, that's just to get a handle on it, right? We're going to choose random 232 by 232 by three patches from that 256 by 256 by three pat, uh, resizing. And we're doing that, right? So our algorithm, our model, doesn't know where this hurricane is going to be in the vicinity of the patch, right? Because if we give it to 256 by 256 every time, and every time the satellite image has a shot with the hurricane, or the cyclone, sorry, right in the middle, the algorithm's gonna learn to expect that every time, right? And then when it's off to the side, it might not figure that out. So it's a way of doing kind of some data augmentation. And again, in the notebook, just make sure we shut it down. That's the most important thing there is. And we'll go ahead and get on this. So again, um, before we even begin, right? Check your kernels. Make sure you don't have any kernels running. Hopefully everybody can see this, I'm gonna zoom in. All right, so instead of intro to DL, we'll be in tropical cyclone. And we go to approach. I thought there was a start. Oh, the problem statement, there we go. And yeah, just take your time, read this through and really get an idea of what we're doing. And I mean that from all the, all the slides, all the slides, all the notebooks, right? So the notebooks are extremely well-written. Approaching the problem, here's the data we have. You could look at the data on your, on your own if you really wanted to. Each image is annotated with a category. We know that of cyclone intensity using the text data, right? So we have a task, there's a variety of tasks. And we really just wanna get these images and classify. All right, so from there, I think I'm just gonna let you all, I think we're gonna start to break out rooms, Troy, and get going. Um, it's 12, almost 12.30, 9.30 right now. And you have an hour and 15 minutes to work on this. Is that right? Let's see, you just had this slide up. When are we stopping this, 10.30? Yes. 10.30, so you have an hour. So that's, that's good enough time. Um, but really dig in. And then when you get to the challenge, the competition here, it's basically gonna to try to utilize everything from the previous notebooks for you to get the best training performance um, for your model period, right? The best validation testing performance. And it's a great data set because there's imbalance, right? So there's a notebook about imbalance data set. And we have that because, you know, how many Cat5 hurricanes are there in the world, right? There's not many, I think in the last, you know, several decades, only six has made landfall on this side of the United States alone. So there's not a whole ton of data on Cat5. So that's something we got to keep in mind, right? So it goes through that, how to work on imbalanced data sets, how you manipulate and pre-process the text data to the image data. But the competition, you know, feel free in your breakout room to just make it open, right? Open collaboration. Um, if you want to work by yourself, that's totally fine. You don't have to talk. Obviously, you don't have to take your camera off, anything like that. You can just, you know, nose to the grindstone and get to it. But if you, uh, if you, if you want to collaborate with your teammates in your lab, in your breakout room, please do. There's, there's no issues in that. And then I'll check in periodically and see how everyone's doing. Is there a Slack room for the challenge? Troy. Yes, there's a challenges channel. 
Oh, there it is. Yeah, so once you get to the competition part, if you want to post what you got for the very last, uh, where is it? The very last accuracy, this right here, the test model against validation set. So your accuracy and score, your loss, please post that in there. And, uh, you know, we'll give comeuppance and, and praise to the highest, the highest accuracy, lowest loss, right? Um, but yeah, so good luck. And Troy, it's all you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Caleb. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. Um, the configuration of the breakout rooms uh, wouldn't save for me last night, um, so you'll probably be in a different room. Uh, but again, each uh, room has a TA, um, so the TA will just introduce themselves briefly again. Um, and you are free to move around, so if there's a, a, if you were involved in conversations yesterday, I know so a few of you have slacked me. Um, feel free to jump around to a different room. Um, if you've already been working with other people, I don't mind. Um, and with that, I will whisk you off into breakout rooms. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, hope you all got a chance for a break in. Um, we'll go ahead and turn this back over to Caleb um, so you can talk about what we just went through and then introduce the next session. All right, cool. So we saw a lot of cool things that we used yesterday to be applied today, right? So that was reassuring. And you could see, let's see. And we had some people in the uh, challenge get done. Looks like 97.5 is the best. So that's really good. That's really good. All right, so uh, wait a second, let me pull this up. Troy, you gotta, I'm gonna let you quit sharing your screen. Cool. Thank you. All right, I think everyone can see that. Um, I think the the best part of this lab, right? And we had some good discussions. So yeah, the, the text data was used to label those 15 minute increments, right? For the satellite to help label it. <clears throat> so we could get something going with training. And the imbalance part, that's one of my favorite ones, right? So we use something called data augmentation. And you know, there's a lot of scrutiny behind the augmentation of the satellite images. For instance, anyone who knows anything about hurricanes would probably argue you can't horizontally, horizontally flip them because they rotate differently, right? I, I'm not sure if uh, that's true or not. Um, I had someone bring that up in a, the NASA boot camp that you couldn't have them rotate a certain way because hurricanes don't spin that way. Um, so things like that. So it's interesting, right? Here we do flipping, right? So we uh, we just flip the image and it seems to work. And there's other augmentation techniques you could do too. Um, and that's something you would have tried in the competition if you would have got to the competition. And it's okay, you can work on this afterwards too, right? If you download it to your local system, you can do it. And I think they have access to Curiosity throughout the weekend. So any of that could work. Um, yeah, really, really good lab. The approach to the problem was great. Um, this alternative approach was something kind of skeptical someone brought up. So I was trying to read through it and I don't quite get it other than we're gonna to try to take the six hour increments and break them down to 15, which seems kind of impossible. Um, nonetheless, it's a very, very good lab manipulating the data, why we do it. And the paper is in the uh, problem statement here. So if you copy, I thought we had a link to it. But anyways, if you just Google this, it'll take you to, uh, their paper, where they go through and what they were doing, why they did what, why they picked the sizes they picked, and things like that. So check that out if you're curious on anything you did in the notebook. And this is pretty cool because they actually go through each layer and they kind of break out what's being learned too in the activation map. So that's, that's really interesting. So I highly suggest reading into it. Um, so I'm doing that. Oh, there's something I had to bring up. 
everyone, please, when you finish a tab, when you finish a notebook, please shut down your kernel, right? And when we leave them up, you'll get OOMs. And other than that, it will drain the node, we'll get a bunch of errors, and it's just not good, right? So we desperately need you all to close your kernels, shut them down when you're not working on that notebook. Um, as you can see, you know, I ran the approach. It saves everything out when you close down the kernel. It doesn't like delete it. So you'll have it there to look at if you want to go back. So yeah, so just, just try to do, try to remember to do that without me having to constantly tell you, like I do my kids all the time. All right, so now we're going into 